Um, thank you all for coming on this very cold evening. Um, we really appreciate it. And we're excited to talk a bit more about the project, which we just launched in Mongolia. Um, so our agenda is to give a little bit of an overview and introduce ourselves, and then um, give a more substantial presentation on the background of the project, um, which relates to the Chinese Belt and Road and how that's impacting the region and um, the Chinese um, near neighbors in Central Asia and Mongolia. And then we'll talk more about our timeline and the expected outputs and um, various ways in which we hope to engage the public in this project. So hopefully see some of you again. Um, so just to introduce ourselves, um, my name is Ariel. As Trisha said, I work for the School for Geography and the Environment. Um, I'm American though, so I'm very happy to be here at the American Center for Mongolian Studies. Um, and I did my PhD in, um, uh, finished in 2015, and my project was on rural livelihoods and bind hunger. So this is a little bit of a shift in focus for me, which I'm really excited about. And I'll just hand it over to um, Biemba, if you mm -hmm. want to introduce yourself. Well, <coughs> my name is Biemba, and uh, currently I'm working for the National University of Mongolia. And at the same time, the Mongolian NGO, IRIM, Independent Research Institute of Mongolia. And uh, <coughs> my, my, my research usually focus on the pastoralism and social networks and also at the same time the mining and its impact. And so since 2011 I have uh, <coughs> conducted the field work mainly in the Gobi in Dondro Vamak and also in Ofsamak and also in Aranga and uh, Hintiamak. And so four main places are my field research area and uh, <coughs> for this project uh, I'm contributing more on this the pastoralists and also on governance side and uh, this is it now. yeah okay thank you um, Stephen? yeah my name is Stephen Lizak and I uh, am a researcher on this project I teach environmental political theory at the School of Geography and the Environment at Oxford. Uh, I first came to Mongolia to do a research project on uh, artisanal and small-scale mining. And did field work in South Gobi province and in Orhan Valley. Uh, and I'm very excited to be back and working on this infrastructure-oriented work. Uh, a lot of similarities, but obviously a lot of important differences too, moving from the small-scale mining community to these very international, globalized infrastructure economies. Excellent. And we have a few people um, that aren't here today, which I want to um, also mention. We have a co I in Central Asia, um, based in Kyrgyzstan, named Kemal. And um, if you go to a website, you can learn more about his profile, but he works at the um, Institute for Public Policy at the University of Central Asia. Um, we also have our PI, our, uh, our um, primary investigator, named Fiona McConnell, also at the School for Geography at Oxford, and uh, Troy Sternberg, who is one of our postdocs. And we have a wonderful team of researchers in Mongolia, um, and Nadia is one of them, who's in the front row. Um, so when we have questions, hopefully we can all talk together at that time. So that's us, and to give a bit more about uh, the overview for the project. Um, so we, um, we are funded by the UK's uh, ESRC. This is the Economic and Social Research Council. And the Economic and Social Research Council um, is partnering with another fund called the Global Challenges Research Fund. Um, so they're interested in promoting more research that has impact. So a large part of our grant is uh, research related with um, hopefully having impact on the ground, which is why we're interested in thinking about new ways to promote sustainable infrastructure development. Um, and as Bimba mentioned, our research collaborators are the Independent Research Institute of Mongolia and the um, University of Central Asia, which has campuses in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. But we're focused on work in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan for the purposes of this project. Um, and our project started on September 1st, and it will last for two and a half years. So, um, so we have a lot more time to hopefully engage with scholars in Mongolia and elsewhere. Um, so the aims of our project are to, um, let's just make sure. Um, the aims of our project um, are threefold. We want to um, develop this Gobi framework, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Um, and so we're examining a model that was used in the South Gobi in Han Bogatsum around OT, which was used to um, deal with a conflict between local herders and the mining company. 
And this um, model began in 2012. It was um, uh, mediated by the CAO, the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman of the IFC. And so we found this to be a really interesting model and potentially um, really useful in context outside of Mongolia. Um, and I, I've talked about this model in past talks at ACMS, so, um, so hopefully maybe some of you have attended those talks. Um, so we won't get into a huge amount of detail about the TPC, uh, the Tripartite Committee, but just to mention that um, we're, a huge part of our work in Mongolia is examining how that process worked and what we can learn from it and what were the successes and limitations of that model and how we can then develop um, something that could be moved into Central Asia. Um, and into Central, specifically on Belt and Road, uh, Chinese Belt and Road projects. Um, so, um, just make sure I'm moving the right way, yes. Okay, um, so the aims of the project are, again, the two other aims are to address these challenges that are really inherently part of a lot of me mega infrastructure projects, which is around uh, fostering cooperation between local peoples um, and some of the mega, mega projects that are being developed to promote transparency, um, to include uh, a diversity of stakeholders, and that can be really challenging um, in contexts such as Central Asia, for example, um, which have a lot of uh, lack of co government capacity to do a lot of these things or to facilitate a lot of this capacity building. Um, and, sec and the third aim is to, um, is to try to enhance the capacity of communities to, um, to engage with companies in, in different ways. Um, so we'll talk about this more um, in the coming slides. As I mentioned, um, this work is based on work that I conducted with my colleague Troy Sternberg in 2016. Um, we were independent experts that came in to um, do a study around livelihoods, environment, and the compensation received by herders from the Ointog Goin mine. And we reviewed um, the compensation packages and we were asked by the TPC to do a study of livelihoods and environment. And the document, um, which is here, um, this multidisciplinary report, it's available online, and it um, provided some recommendations, which the TPC is now starting to implement. Um, and they weren't, it was their, it's their choice to what degree they want to implement the recommendations. But, um, so they're working on this now, and so we've, we're now going back to the Gobi and seeing how it's going, how, are this, how, is, these, how is this agreement being implemented, um, what are some of the challenges that they're facing? To what degree is the TPC able to now move um, into this new stage of, uh, of, um, of implementing uh, the, the agreements that, um, that they had come up with? So next slide, I'll hand over to Stephen for a moment. So one of the central things that's on our mind in this project is trying to take this one geographically limited focus of Oyutogo and the TPC and to find ways to both scale it up and scale it out into the broader context of global economic infrastructure development. And so we see this as happening at a time uh, where infrastructure is playing a major role in uh, development, in globalization, uh, and in geopolitics. And there's obviously a whole host of quite significant implications and consequences from this sort of development which presents a unique portfolio of challenges that we're trying to address and trying to mitigate and trying to uh, resolve when these conflicts do arise and hopefully anticipate before they arise in the first place. Um, so just in the last few months actually, or really in this year, uh, I don't know if you all heard in um, Kyrgyzstan, there was uh, a, um, an arson, a burning down of a uh, gold processing, an ore processing plant uh, that was funded as part of a Belt and Road project. Just two weeks ago in Pakistan, in Karachi, the Chinese consulate was attacked by um, uh, Baluchis, Baluchi people uh, as part of their very strong demonstration against Belt and Road uh, initiatives in the Baluchistan region which they see as a direct infringement upon their sovereignty. And so suddenly there's quite a complicated relationship emerging between the development of infrastructure and the feeling, the perceived threat of local peoples that uh, these infrastructures are actually encroaching on the ability of people to have control and authority and sovereignty over their own homelands. 
Uh, and so we can expect these conflicts to, to both continue, but also to set a certain tone for the development of Belt and Road projects. Uh, and certainly this year and in coming years, we'll see more skepticism from a lot of nations as they are approached about Belt and Road Initiative projects and are concerned about the consequences that might arise from entering into those relationships, whether it comes from a huge amount of national debt or these questions of sovereignty and civil unrest. Excellent, thanks, Steve. Um, and also we find that in Central Asia, the areas where we work, there is um, a history of xenophobia, and this obviously also has other consequences around what happens when, um, when there's mega Chinese infrastructure being built, and um, the structure of that is quite different than um, what we see with World Bank or ADB-funded projects, for example, and the way they go about these processes. So um, just to give some history of the Belt and Road, um, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but hopefully um, it's not too much of a repeat. Um, so the Belt and Road isn't necessarily something entirely new. It's an expansion of policies that have been in existence and been developing for quite, for maybe the last 35, 40 years. Um, so the Belt and Road was officially announced in 2013, and um, it was, um, you know, it's been labeled as this one trillion um, dollar investment, but it, the numbers change, it's growing. Um, we don't know exactly how much money um, it is, but certainly um, one trillion dollars or more. Um, it involves over 60 countries, but more and more countries keep being added to the Belt and Road and including um, a lot of countries in South America. So I'm sure that more and more countries will keep um, joining the, the Belt and Road train, gravy train, as some people have referred to it as. And, um, and so it, it does involve this kind of grand vision, these grand narratives around um, you know, uh, Chinese development, building this wonderful connectivity between countries to promote trade um, and, and development um, and to um, foster cooperation between, between these countries. So it's framed in a very um, positive, um, positive light and, um, and obviously there are hopefully a lot of positive things that could come out of these projects. Um, but it's a very diverse array of things that are falling under the Belt and Road. Um, so this is a picture of um, one of the huge forums that brought together a lot of world leaders around this. So it's really um, reached a critical mass now. A lot of people are, are signing on. Um, and so this kind of, um, to give some history, it's coming out of this going out strategy that China had developed in the late 1990s. And this is where the Chinese state encouraged um, many of the, the state-owned enterprises to enter international markets. Um, and this involved a lot of support from the Chinese government um, to you know, give easy access to credit, um, to announce 50 new state um, or, um, SEZs, um, the special economic zones, across um, Africa and Latin America and these regions. So this is part of this expansion out, part of this going out strategy that started to occur in the, in the 1990s. And also related to this um, was um, the, uh, sorry, the creation of policy banks. So the Chinese um, Import-Export Bank um, is a very big development bank. Um, and also the Chinese development bank led the way with the going out strategy. Um, and so there was a, a lot of concessional loan systems, preferential interest rates, again, a lot of state support for this, for this, kind, of, um, this kind of development. Um, and a lot of the literature sort of distinguishes between Chinese development and sort of the um, ODA, the Overseas Development um, Assistance kind of UN um, framework of development, which is more altruistic. Um, Chinese development is more around investment, and it could be a huge range of different investments. So it's a bit different type of development than what um, what uh, the DFID or UNDP or these sorts of organizations would be, would be financing. Um, and again, the majority of this aid usually goes through Chinese corporations, but Chinese corporations are often state-owned and there is a very blurry line between public and private um, organizations. So this is where it sometimes gets quite complicated when you think about the institutions that are involved in, in this sort of development. And one thing that we do see that's particularly interesting is we see the Belt and Road Initiative trying to sort of take on the form or appearance of these international development banks. So even though the, the motivation behind these is much more profit driven uh, than, for example, UNDP funded projects or USAID funded projects, uh, you can really see the, the Belt and Road Initiative sort of putting on the clothes of 
uh, of these other organizations and, and trying to put themselves out there as uh, sort of pursuing the same sort of altruistic development priorities. Yeah, exactly. What the, the grand narrative of the Belt and Road seems to try to, um, you know, promote very similar goals um, as maybe the um, ADB or other sorts of development banks. Um, but the institutions involved are, are, are quite different. So, um, so again, um, uh, alongside the going out strategy, which was focused on investment outside of China, um, around the same time there was another initiative in China, which is called the Open Up the West. So this is about trying to develop the western uh, regions of China. Um, so the eastern coast is like highly developed, and now it's starting to go into Xinjiang, Tibet, other areas to sort of promote infrastructural development there. And as part of um, that investment, we saw a lot more um, development of highway, highways, pipelines, um, the, um, the railway to Tibet, um, these kinds of projects. Um, and again, a lot of the focus was on state centralization, um, national security, social stability. But these were kind of some of the narratives involved in this um, uh, open up, opening up the West uh, strategy. And a lot of the discourse was around development as you know, the Chinese government bringing this gift of development. And Emily Ye has written a lot about um, Chinese development in those areas. So hopefully, um, if you're interested, you can check out some of her work. And so now going back to the um, Belt and Road, uh, again, so we see that this is actually a kind of like an extension of the policies that had already been in place for quite a while, um, but it's trying to focus more on this connectivity between regions. So um, one of the crown jewels of the of the Belt and Road is the Pakistan, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, where there's more than 47 um, million um, dollars being invested in that area. And um, so a lot of the goal is to um, connect China with the oil fields in the um, UAE. So going through Pakistan instead of going through the Straits of Malacca. So anyway, you start to see um, actually oil and mining become really important parts of um, some of the Belt and Road development. And, and so resource mm -hmm. extraction um, and the movement of resources along routes um, between countries actually is, is becoming a big part of these investments. Um, and to give a little bit of a literature review around some of the motivations that's been cited in the literature, um, there's a whole range of motivations that people have talked about. Everything from, um, you know, internationalization of the yuan to um, enhancing Chinese social stability and security. There's all sorts of sort of like analysis about what is, what is the Belt and Road really about. Um, and so our project isn't necessarily interested in that stuff, but it's just, this is just context to give some background about. Um, about what we're seeing in the literature now. And one common theme that you find in the literature is that China is here really positioning itself as a core economic center uh, in a planetary sense. So it's not just interested in continuing to be peripheral to North America and European economies, but it wants to be a core economy in its own right. And so is finding ways to create its own sort of new peripheral economic apparatus and it's seen Central Asia and East Africa and parts of South America as this sort of perfect terrain on which to, to build that foundation. In addition, in addition to that, <coughs> what Stephen said, uh, in Mongolia, the Chinese investment, especially in the development aid, is exceeding the other international organizations in Mongolia. And so, for example, last year, you remember that uh, our prime minister visited and then secured one billion, you know, US dollar investment or kind of aid. And also private sector secured more than one billion US dollar. And so, overall, in the past, since 1990s, Mongolia received around 1.7 billion US dollar aid overall. And so as a, but not investment. And so in comparison, maybe in very near future, the Chinese you know, aid assistance will exceed the overall, all development organizations, I think. And so in this sense, you know, this project is also important you know, for Mongolia. And um, so one thing that's quite interesting, if you look at this, um, if you look at this chart, it's a bit difficult to find a lot of data on on a lot of the Bree projects because they aren't, um, like, unlike some of the 
projects in ADB, you can go on the website and see project documents and the num amount of funding and all, and all of these kinds of things. It's a bit more difficult to get that data um, on these projects. But we can, um, there's been some analysis done. Um, and so we find that it's interesting to see that 51% of the funding is by the big four Chinese state-owned commercial banks. So a lot of people think that a lot of uh, brief funding is coming from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. But at this point, it's just a, a small por proportion of the, um, the other um, funding. So, and the others are China <coughs> Development Bank, Export Import Bank. So again, um, the majority of funding is coming from these, um, the commercial banks and then the development banks of China. So just to kind of give some background what, where the investment is coming from. Um, this is just the, um, I'm sorry, just to move my slide over. Um, this is just a little bit of a. Um, there's, so there's six corridors that have been called that have been named in the in the Bre in Bre the Belt and Road. Um, so the Trans Asian Railway, Trans um, Asian Railway corridors, gas pipeline. So we see like so, some of this infrastructure matrix um, appearing on the map. And what we have to remember is that um, some of this terrain in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and China is really, it's a really extreme geography. I mean, some of the tallest mountain passes are in this area. There's a lot of water scarcity. Um, it's not necessarily an easy place to build infrastructure or pipelines. Um, and so this is having, um, we're also interested in sort of like the environmental impacts of some of these projects, especially when there's scarce water resources, which is one thing that was really um, a huge factor with the OT mine and one reason for conflict. Um, so this is where our project, so just to start to segue into our project, um, the areas where we're working is obviously in Mongolia, and then also in, um, let's see, in um, Kyrgyzstan, uh, where's Kyrgyzstan, oh here we go, Kyrgyzstan, um, and Tajikistan, again bordering China, um, and um, so there's a lot of important trade happening, um, Kyrgyzstan has been an important um, trade hub in the region for a while, Tajikistan is a much uh, poorer country, and doesn't get a lot of outside investment. Um, so again, China is an important trade partner for, for these countries. But the political um, situation in these areas is a bit different than Mongolia. Kyrgyzstan and Mongolia are much more similar in terms of um, having democratic governments than Tajikistan, um, which is more of a dictatorship um, and a bit more difficult to um, do research in. So that's one of our challenges for this project. And. Um, so what our project is, um, the timeline for our project is basically to, um, we've just started to do research, we're starting to, we've gone back to the Gobi, unfortunately we forgot to put um, some pictures here, but Nadia um, maybe can talk about it more because they were just down there. And um, so we've uh, been observing the TPC meetings, observing how this model has worked, how they're implementing the agreement. Um, then we'll do uh, an evaluation of the model and start to see like what are the limitations and other issues around this. Um, and then we will, we really want to have some participatory workshops where hopefully some of you can come and give feedback around um, the types of findings we're having and get a sense of, okay, well, how can this be made into sort of a model that might move elsewhere, elsewhere, or if we don't want to use the model, then at least some guiding principles that we can like take with us to different contexts. Um, so we want to kind of try to engage the public with our analysis, which is a bit unusual for academics who usually <coughs> shut the door and you know, do analysis behind, our, behind the doors. Um, and then, um, so then we'll start our field work in, um, in the uh, Central Asia. Um, and let's see if this is switched over. Um, yes, so then from um, next year, we'll do more of the development of our Gobi framework. So the idea is that we're taking this really exciting model from Mongolia. It's a Mongolia model. It's a Mongolia brand. It's the Gobi framework. It's not a framework that was created by the USAID or from the Netherlands or something. It's an in, kind of more of an indigenous model that worked. And we want to see if have Mongolians take it to Central Asia and try to um, explain the sorts of things that Mongolia has been going through with <coughs> the mega infrastructure development here, so that um, hopefully at least the local communities can um, try to develop some positive approach um, and try to maybe stop the, uh, or before things become violent, for example, in Kyrgyzstan or even in areas um, beyond Kyrgyzstan, maybe there's more steps in the process before local communities feel like they have to attack um, infrastructure. So just to, just to see that our overall vision is kind of moving in that direction. Um, yeah, go ahead, Smith. Yeah, and this has particular significance that we're developing this model in Mongolia and hoping to bring it out to other Central Asian countries. 
because uh, in these contexts of development and infrastructure and conflict mediation, there's often a perception and a reality that uh, mediation models and general dispute resolution procedures are brought in from really far-flung places. Uh, for example, a lot of the mediation work around artisanal and small-scale mining in Mongolia was brought in from South American contexts. And generally, when you have these very distant models brought in to uh, very different political communities, I think there's a sense of, okay, who are these Americans coming in from Washington, D.C., who used to work in Peru, telling us about how to deal with this infrastructure conflict that's affecting our livelihoods. Whereas the, the sense of um, sort of regional community that, that exists around uh, countries that are in Central Asia and on the periphery of China, I think there's a sense of, um, if not shared identity, at least some shared experience of these geopolitical issues of an environmental context, of an economic context. And so being able to say this came from Mongolia rather than came from Central America or came from Washington, D.C., we're hoping will lend a, a particular heft to this work and uh, give it a little more traction when it hits the ground in uh, Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan or other countries after that. Moreover, <laughs> Moreover Mongolia has, a, even though we have uh, just 28 years of uh, democratic you know, the governance uh, and also history, I mean, and also we have only maybe over 20 years of experience extracting all those minerals. But we have a huge experience. We protested the mining and also civil society organizations involved in, and we jailed some of the people in the prison, and also we just burned the cars, you know, in front of the OT, you remember. And so, after all, there is a, this initiative, trilateral, you know, tripartite committee, and so on this committee, the herders, together with the civil society, they, you know, joined the force and then become a one party. And this is a good lesson. And so we really want to export this initiative and Mongolian model. And also, by luck or whatever, I participated in bringing that model from Latin America. And for example, Bolivia and Peru, I participated in that you know, <laughs> activity. And so really, you said the truth. It is a foreign, very far from Mongolia and Peru, for example. It has a 100, 200 years of experience you know, extracting and mining all those minerals. And they have different cultures. But in Mongolia, it is totally different. And so you said that that model doesn't work in Mongolia. Uh, but Gobi model will fit in Kyrgyzstan case, I, I think, because of our cultural same root. And also, we are at the same geographical location. And uh, OK, that's it, what they want to add. So, so yeah, this is the thrust of our project. And just to give a little bit on the outputs that we're expecting to, to, to produce. Um, so obviously the normal academic outputs like um, publications and hopefully an edited volume. Um, but also we want to do training. Um, so at ACMS um, later this month we'll do a training on a, a qualitative data analysis. So trying to um, train more um, academics in how to do this sorts of analysis. Um, and, um, and training around environmental monitoring that local people might participate in. Um, so we have other um, kind of outputs that we like to like to try to, um, to put forward, and um, so yeah, our output slide continues um, with uh, yeah, just creating, just bringing people into rooms and creating networks. Um, we'll hope we, we are hoping will be one um, important output that people can keep talking to each other beyond the length of this project, um, and. We have an idea of making an app, that uh, a mobile ICT application, that could be a way um, to foster communication between, um, for example, Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan, or Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. We aren't sure what that will look like yet, but if anyone has experience working in, on apps, we'd be happy to, uh, and excited to discuss 
um, some potential ways that we can develop that. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully have a usable handbook of some sort, which people can then um, use and various organizations can incorporate into their work. So that's a general range of outputs that we're looking at. Well, and yeah, I just want to highlight this last point, develop and trial the Gobi framework in Mongolia and Central Asia, is, is really central to what we're doing and why we think that that our research project is really quite different in this regard from some of the, the past work that's been done in this way. So as we head down to Hanbog on Thursday, we're going to be looking at uh, obviously the results of a mediation procedure that was set off in 2012. Uh, so it's hardly a, a, a new conflict at this point. And so because we've been looking sort of longitudinal, longitudinally, excuse me, at the TPC and the OU-Tolgoi process, we're hoping to be able to find other infrastructure projects that are uh, more nascent, that are just starting out, and to really trial this method, to be able to bring it to them and say, okay, here's a potential conflict or a conflict in its very early stages as a form of genuine action research, let's take this model that we've just developed, we've seen it work in Oyu Tolgoi to a certain extent, we can refine upon it further from what we've seen in the Oyu Tolgoi um, and the, uh, the mediation model that might not have worked so well there, so we have an improved version, can this actually work in practice on the ground? So we're not bringing this out and finalizing the Gobi framework, just saying, well, these are our observations of something that's happened in the past. We are observing, we are, uh, we are sort of analyzing, and then we're actually gonna try to do something with it. So we'll, we'll have a couple case studies that we can point to and say, this worked in Kyrgyzstan, this worked in Tajikistan. Uh, let's see if we can make this the new gold standard for addressing these sorts of infrastructure and development-related conflicts. That's it. So if you guys have any questions, we're happy to uh, take them. Cheers.